So we're seeing ourselves through to the end of this Joseph series, and we find ourselves tonight stepping into Genesis chapter 42 and 43, the full thing. And really what we begin to unpack is the fact that Joseph is experiencing this kind of seeing ghosts, we called it. He's seeing these people out of his past come back into his life, and what's about to happen is um, critical and it teaches us stories and things, uh, not stories, a narrative and an understanding of God's heart and what God's about. And there's things in Joseph that teach today as clearly as they did back then because it's the living, active Word of God and the Word of God never returns void. So tonight we are going to um, marinate in the Word of God for a long time. We're going to be there for a while and what we're going to do is we're going to understand a little bit of more of this story, but we're also going to try to uproot some stuff in us. Before we do that, I want to I want to kind of open and give you an image in your head. When I was uh, little, we had two dogs, Muffin and Biscuit, and they were awesome, Springer Spaniels, English Springers, and they were great dogs. And one day, um, they, uh, I don't know how they did it, but they captured this calico cat that looked like it had been, well, eaten by two Springer Spaniels because they, they summarily devoured this cat. And we, being good Christian neighbors, got a shovel and began to dig up a hole and bury the evidence because the neighbors were like, Toonsies, Toonsies. And we're like, oh, I haven't seen her in a while. There's parts of her here, you know. We are digging a hole. We throw Toonsies in the garden to contribute to the tomato plants. We figured, why waste a good cat? And, um, and so we, we, we put her away. And, um, and the, a few days later, I remember looking out there, and my, my dog Muffin, who was the best dog ever, take that shadow, my current dog. Um, so, but Muffin was out there, and I see her tearing away. I'm like, oh, no. She dug up Toonsies. So we go out there and we're like, shoo, oh, it smells so bad. And we covered Toonsies up and then we're like, no, and we really dig a deep hole this time. And we buried her. But Muffin and Biscuit would dig this cat up because, that, well, it's kind of what you do. And tonight we're going to talk about one of the, re- the issues and the realities that we have as Christians when we try to take sin that's lived in our life and we've lived it out and we try to bury it and it goes unrepentant, unforgiven, and undealt with in our lives. Eventually, we, like Muffin and Biscuit, dig, a, dig up something that's fairly necrotic and disgusting and we have to deal with it on God's terms, not ours. We're going to jump right into Genesis chapter 42 and we're going to follow that that through as we go. Uh, Genesis 42 and 43 it says this, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? <laughs> I, okay, let's just unsanitize scripture. Have you ever said to your kids, hey guys, get in the car, and they're like, okay. <laughs> guys, get in the car. Oh, yeah. <sighs> why are you sitting there? Get in the car. Don't you hear the dad in Jacob here? Jacob's just like, so why are we staring at each other till we starve? You can see the kind of the dadness coming on. Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down there, buy some food for us so that we may live and we don't die. Then 10 of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother. He didn't send him with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain, for there was a famine in the land of Canaan. Notice this with me. Do you see the breach in trust? Jacob is not going to send Benjamin, the other son. So remember, we had Leah who gave birth to most of Jacob's sons, Rachel, who gave birth to Benjamin and Joseph. Then there were other two helpers that we're not going to talk about, and uh, they, they had given birth to some sons. But jo- Joseph and Benjamin were really, they were the sons of Rachel, the wife that Jacob loved. And Jacob, this makes you wonder if Jacob had, maybe he knew a little more than even he wanted to admit. He was not going to send his son with the other brothers out into the wilderness. He wasn't going to do that again because, well, maybe he just didn't know if the brothers had leveled with him on what really happened that day in the desert when Joseph went missing according to a wild animal eating him. 
goes on to say, now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all of its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized him, but he pretended to be a stranger and he spoke harshly to him, to, to them. Now, I just want you to think with me real quick what this would feel like. Think what this would feel like when you're Joseph sitting there in your, in your palace and these brothers come in and they do the very thing that you dreamed they would do. They bow down to you. I wonder if he was just a little bit gobsmacked and his jaw hung open just like, oh, is this really happening? But he also does something that shows he's, um, that he's, he's wily. We all have this reptilian brain. Has anybody ever heard of that term? the reptilian brain, and you're like, am I part snake? No, but we have this thing right back here in the back of our brain, and it's called the reptilian brain. And when you and I get something that jumps out and scares us, we do one of two things. We fight or we flight. If you wonder if you're fight or flight, like if you go up to somebody on Halloween, you scare them and they punch you in the mouth, not a lot of flight there. <laughs> you know, like if it, you, fight or flight is do you engage or do you retreat? And quite often, when we go there, we lose all logic. It's all logic goes away. We get an adrenaline rush, and we kind of go a little bit nutty. We quit making sense. Think to your most recent battle with your spouse, right? You just didn't make sense, and in the end, you're like, I'm not bright. I'm sorry. I got a little wound up. I got a little too fighty, right? Notice what Joseph does. He buys himself time by doing the thing. He, he recognizes them. They're not looking for Joseph. He recognizes them, but they don't, they don't see who he is. So what does he do? He reinforces the facade and he speaks harshly to him. I don't think he's getting even at them at this point. I think what he's doing is putting up a wall so that he understands, he understands he can't just explode at them. Imagine the volcano of emotions that came roaring back to him. Imagine what it was like to see them. Joseph is buying himself time and we'll see it again. He says to them very harshly, where do you come from? From the land of Canaan, they replied, we're here to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams. So now we see he's talking to him, them, and he's got to be like, well, I told you guys this would happen. Like, there had to be emotion just boiling out of him at this point, and he channels it into a very angry facade of an Egyptian ruler's. He remembers his dreams, and he says to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. I love this element of it. He takes all that emotion, and he channels it into a very accusatory, angry, indicting individual. And they're now kind of gone to the fight or flight, and they're like, run away, because they know this guy's really ticked off. And they say, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We're all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. How would that sit in Joseph's ear? Oh, so we're honest men now. Did you tell Pop about the pit and selling me? You see, like when you hear somebody who's lied on you, say, oh, we're honest men, are you really? Because I would like to hit you like a pinata till candy pops out. Like you would want that. Ugh. But Joseph maintains this facade and he says, no, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is with our father and another one is no more. Oh, what did that sound like to Joseph? He's like, oh, he's so much more than you ever thought. <laughs> he's wearing eyeliner and about to devastate you. Like, I, think about that. One is with our dad and the other is no more. And Joseph's just like, I just want you to get the humanity of scripture here. This is a young man who was sold. Can you imagine what he's feeling? He's like, no, I'm not no more. I'm right here. I'm right here. But Joseph said, it is just as I told you. You are spies, and this is how you'll be tested. As surely as Pharaoh leaves, you will not leave this place until your young, unless your youngest brother comes here. To which you can hear the air in their balloon. 
like, oh, man, dad's never letting Ben go with us. He says, send one of your number to your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. Now, I'm not saying there was poetic justice in this. But um, it had to feel kind of good to throw him in a pit, even if it was for three days. Just be like, lock him up. He has this moment where he puts them away, and they are terrified. On the third day, Joseph says this to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison. Let's see what you do when only one of you is left while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and you, that you may not die. Do you see the threat that's not hidden there? He's finding out the character of his brothers. Have they changed? Have they matured? Have they regretted it? Are they sorry? He's, he's ferreting out some of this truth. Then they proceeded to do this. They said to one another, now I want you to catch this. They begin talking to one another like when your children are arguing about who broke the glass and they're arguing about it and the parents are standing there just going, okay, we'll let you work this out. That's what's happening. They begin talking around to one another and they say to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen and that's why why this distress has come on our life. Then Reuben replies. I love Reuben. He's like, it's all your fault. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. No, you wouldn't do anything. So now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize Joy Joseph understood them because he was using a translator. <laughs> like, can you imagine? Just Don't you wish they could just, like the moment where they realized Joseph heard it all? They'd be like, oh man, he heard it all. He heard these words from their lips and it had to sound like an echo of thunder, just boom. So you knew how I felt. You knew I was afraid. You hated me that much and you've lived with this guilt this long. It says that Joseph turned away from them and began to weep, but that he came back to them again and he had Simeon taken from them and bound before them. The older brother Simeon is bound in front of his brothers. Joseph marches him off to prison with his guards, and he says, come back with your little brother. And off the other brothers go. Joseph gave orders to his guards to fill their bags, to put each man's silver back in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. After this was done for them, they loaded their grain on their donkeys, and they left. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw the silver in the mouth of his sack, in the opening of the sack. My silver has been returned to me, he said to his brothers. Here it is, in my sack. Their hearts sank. And they turned to each other, trembling, and said, what is this that God has done? Okay, help me here. Anybody here ever been at a restaurant and somebody pays your bill for you, unwittingly? Just, Yeah? When that happened to you, you're like, oh, what judgment? What has God done? Did you do that? Or were you like, dang it, I would have got the steak, you know? Like, <laughs> right? Because you know you would have. You're like, I shouldn't have gone cheeseburger. I should have gone steak. Um, but if you think about it, who here, when somebody does something kind for you, is like, oh, and start trembling. Oh, what's happened? Oh, this is the worst. Why is God judging me? All their silver was back in the bag. All their money was back in the bag. This reminds me of Proverbs 28, verse 1, and it says this, the righteous are bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no one's chasing them. These guys had dirty consciences, and they're digging up old memories. Remember? They've already dug the memory of what they did to Joseph up. Uh, you know, they've, Reuben dug up that he tried to defend him but didn't do anything in the end. They're all kind of digging this stuff up. Their conscience is absolutely wrecked over the memory of Joseph. So they flee even when good things happen to them. They don't know how to handle it. 
When they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told them all that had happened to them. And they said, the man who is Lord over the land spoke harshly to us, and he treated us as though we were spying on the land. But we said to him, we are honest men, not spies. We were 12 brothers, sons of one father. One is no more, and the youngest is now with our father in Canaan. Then the man who is Lord over the land said to us, this is how I will know. Whether you are honest men, leave one of your brothers here with me and take food for your starving families and go. But bring your youngest brother to me so I will know that you are not spies, but you are honest men. See, then I will give your brother back to you and you can trade in the land. Do you see this little pivot that happens here? He, he says, go do these things and I will open all the best of Israel uh, or of Egypt up to you. He kind of, there's this invitation. They see it as purely negative, but... I think it's interesting. As they were empty in their sacks, and each man's sacks was the pouch of silver, when they and their father saw the money pouches, so the father now sees they come back with all this money, they were frightened. They were frightened that they had done something wrong. And their father Jacob said to them, you have deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. To which Simeon's like, I'm in prison. Anytime, come get me. But he's like, Simeon is no more, and now you want to take Benjamin. Everything is against me. Everything is against me. Then Reuben said to his father, you may put both of my sons to death if I don't bring him back to you. Entrust him to my care and I will bring him back. How does a father do such a thing with that? But then it says, my son, Jacob says, my son will not go down there with you. His brother is dead and he is the only one left. How does that sound to the brothers? Thanks, dad. There's the, all the other brothers are there, but he's saying the son of my wife that I loved is the only one left. If harm comes to him on the journey, you are taking, the journey you are taking, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in sorrow. He does not trust his sons. He doesn't trust their motivations. He doesn't fully, you can tell, he doesn't fully buy in to what happened years ago and well, it goes on in 43 to say, now the famine was still severe in the land. Chapter 43, this is. So when they had eaten all the grain they brought from Egypt, their father said, go back and buy us a little more food. But Judah said to him, the man, would be Joseph, warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother along with us, we will go down and buy food for you. But if you will not send Benjamin, we will not go down. We will stare at each other and die, is what he's saying. Because this man said, you will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. Israel asked, and I love this, have you ever had something where you feel kind of at the end of your rope and you say something kind of crazy? This is Israel. Just imagine, he's hearing this, he's realizing if they're going to die, they're either going to die in Canaan, Benjamin will die starving in Canaan, or he'll die in Egypt. He doesn't know, and he says, why did you bring this trouble on me by telling the man you had another brother? He had super ticked at him. He's like, oh, why did you have to pipe up and talk about Benjamin? Why can't you zip it? What is going on? And they replied, the man questioned us closely about ourselves and our family. Is your father still living, he asked. Do you have another brother, they asked. We simply answered his questions. How were we to know? He would say, bring your brother down. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, and I find this fascinating, send the boy, Benjamin, along with me, and we will go at once so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. I can, you can hold me personally responsible for him. If I don't bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all of my life. Do you notice he doesn't threaten to kill his own children to take Benjamin, he says, I will stand before you unblinking and bear the guilt and the blame all my life of not bringing him back. As it is, Dad, if we hadn't delayed, we could have gone and returned twice thus far, which means Benjamin or Simeon now knows he's stuck in prison in Egypt. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be done, then do this. 
Put some of the best products of our land in your bags. Take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm, a little honey, some spices, some myrrh, and pistachio nuts and almonds. Put them in your bags. Take double the amount of silver with you because you guys didn't pay your tab last time for you must return the silver that was put back in the mouth of your bags. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once. Now catch this, verse 14. And may God Almighty grant you mercy. Please hold on to that phrase. May God Almighty grant you mercy before that man so that he will let your brother and Benjamin come back with you. Do you see the little prophetic, like if if Scripture was a harp, bong, the prophetic string just got played. Do you notice he doesn't say Simeon? He says, let your other brother and Benjamin come back with you. There's this prophetic haunting that goes on in this, and I love it. He doesn't even know that what he's saying is something God's already intending to do. God's already intending to return to him. But he goes on and shows his darker kind of like, oh, and he says, but as for me, if I am bereaved, if I am left with nothing, then I'm bereaved. So be it. And he sends them on their way. So the men took their gifts and doubled the amount of silver and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. And I think this is where we get into, um, this is is where there's some real nuance to it. And and I'm excited to look at it because there's this prophetic tone that took place. But then we see this. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of the, the house, take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare a meal. Let's just rewind the story. Kind of jump back. Remember when Joseph was thrown in the cistern? What did the brothers do? They sat down and had a meal while he was in the cistern. When they needed a good cover story, what did they do? They killed an animal, covered covered the garment in blood, and said to Jacob, your son's dead. Do do you see how this is all hearkening back? Another animal's dying, and the sons of Jacob are sitting down to a meal, and everything is about to change. Everything is about to go different. Slaughter an animal and prepare a, prepare a meal. They are going to eat with me at, no, at noon. The man did as Joseph told him. He took them into Joseph's house. Now, this is again digging up old feelings, okay? They're digging up old feelings. Now, having been invited to the house of the king for lunch, the men were frightened. Okay, you're good with it. All right, the men were frightened when they were taken to his house. They thought... I love how they put this together. We were brought here because of the silver that was put back in our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us. He wants to overpower us, seize us for slaves, and take our donkeys. <laughs> it's like Egypt's first carjacking right there. Like, and like who, that is the worst theory on what's about to happen. They, they have such guilty consciences. They are drawing conclusions that make absolutely no sense. And they're sitting there worried and terrified. So in all their anxiety, they went up to Joseph Stewart and spoke to him at the entrance of the house. And he said, we beg your pardon, our Lord. You know, there's not a lot of manly oomph behind that. It's not like, excuse me, sir, none of that. Uh, We beg your pardon, our Lord. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk to you, but uh, just real quick, we came down here the first time to buy some food, but um, at the place where we stopped for the night when we opened our bags, um, and each of us found his silver the exact weight and the kind of the mouth of the sack, you know, when you open it, it's right there in the the mouth of the sack. So we brought it back with us. We brought it back with us. We also brought some additional silver with us to buy food because clearly we want to pay for it. We weren't trying to rob you. And um, we don't know who put the silver in our sacks. It's all right. The steward says, he had to be like, why are you guys so weird? (laughs) He had you over for lunch. The dude's putting on a meal and you're fighting for yesterday's check. It makes no sense. It's all right, he said. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. Then he brought Simeon out to them. I love that. Simeon must have been like, So, we waited. 
He got a taste of Joseph's life. The steward took the men into Joseph's house. He gave them water to wash their feet, fodder for their donkeys. They prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they were to eat there. So they knew they were over for a meal. When Joseph came home, they presented him uh, to him the gifts they had brought into the house. They bowed down before him to the ground, and he asked, how, uh, how are you? And he said, how is your aged father that you told me about? Is he still living? Let's just hold the tension there. He's wondering, is my dad still alive? Has it taken too long and his dad died? They don't know this, but his heart, can you imagine how long that question hung in the air when the translator's like, okay, and he's like, hurry up. You know, ask the question. He's wondering, is dad still alive? He's wondering, well, If he's still with him, will I ever get to see my dad again? They replied, your servant, our father, is still alive, and he is well. And they bowed down, and they prostrated, laid themselves face down in front of him. And the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams comes to pass right there. And he looked about, and he saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And he asked, is this the younger brother, the one you told me about? And he said, listen to this. Remember when I said to you what Jacob said? And may God... Be gracious and merciful to you in the eyes of that man. And this is the response of that man. God, be gracious to you, my son. His prayer is answered. Word for word, the father and the son, Joseph, say the same thing. But Joseph enacts the mercy. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out to look for a place to weep. And he went to his private room and he wept there. Now I want you to just picture it with me. Is, the, is your father still alive? Yes. There had to be like a kind of a catching of the breath. I'm going to see my dad. So the emotion begins to build. And then he says, is this the little brother? Is this the one that you told me about? My, my mother's son? Yes, this is him. And he gets to that moment when you can't help but cry. Help me out. Guys, have you ever had that? Anybody? Yeah, it's the worst. When you're trying to talk, you're like, oh, no. And it, it holds up right here, like Erica at Les Mis. I've never seen such weeping. Her whole face cried. When Eponine starts singing, I'm like, what happened? Did someone say something to you? Like, I was ready to go. She's like, oh, it's just so sad. And I'm like, well, it's long, but it's not sad, you know. Anyways, she just wept, wept. Like, come on, guys. Have you ever been like Titanic? Remember when you saw Titanic and you're like, yeah, it's cool. When people weren't looking, you're like, yeah. <laughs> And you just want to like, you just want to let it out, just have a good cleansing cry. Not the quiet Demi Moore tear, but the howling, barking, gagging, sobbing, the real cry. That's what Joseph did. Joseph was like this. And he hit the door. He ran out. He found a closet and he cried. He cried so hard, he had to wash his face. He had those tear lines. He cried so hard. And then he walked out, and he controlled himself. But it was that kind of control. I think if we look at it, it's the kind of control you have when um, you can't say much. You just got to get through it. So what does he say? Serve the food. Okay. And off they go. The meal begins right there. They served him, Joseph, by himself, and the brothers by themselves. And the Egyptians who ate with them with him by themselves, because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that's detestable to, detestable to uh, Egyptians. I just think that's awesome. Joseph's like, detestable. All right, so um, to his brothers. The men had been seated before him in order of their ages, from firstborn to the youngest, and they looked at each other in astonishment. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times bigger than all the others. So they feasted. And they drank freely with him. Oh, you don't want the story to stop there, right? You're like, oh, no. Keep going, but you can't because there is too much in this that we have to unpack because the reality is we as sinful people have to deal with the fact that we're going to come face to face with our past. And our past very often defines us. We can be abused or harmed in our past and never mature beyond a certain age. We have to deal with our past. We have to deal with the sin that is in our lives, the willful choices and the unintentional oops-a-daisy sins, the sins that God takes very seriously because he sent Christ to die on the cross for sin. We have to deal with it today. When you come face-to-face with your past, 
And when you come to face to face with your past sins, there's a reality that the Christian knows that no other faith or tradition or philosophy can give you. See, when you come face to face with your past sins, as a Christian, we understand very boldly that it's never buried. It's never buried. Our sin has always been there. It will always be there. Look at how the brothers return to their sin like a dog returns to his vomit. The brothers always go back. It must be because of Joseph. Remember what we did to him? They always go back to their sin. So here's the reality for us Christians. We must stop pretending that sin doesn't matter and we can bury it deep enough that God doesn't see it. That will never be the case. And we will always dig it up and deal with it until we do the one thing that we as Christians were invited to do. We can confess it into the ear of him who died on the cross for you. We can repent of it and turn away from sinful patterns that have broken our heart, our lives, and the heart of God. And we can follow Christ in mission and in purpose and in purity, not because of our morality, but because in Christ our sins hold us no longer. And they are buried in the past, but they are buried in the wounds of Christ. Amen? We don't have to hold on to that. That's buried in Christ. And in Christ, the wounds of Christ are buried, all our sins, and he took them on himself freely because he loved us. So when you come face to face with your past sins, like the brothers did, I want to invite you to do what they seem to never do. Quit arguing about it, quit debating it, quit trying to find out motive, and confess it and admit I sinned. Repent of it, turn from it, and walk away. No longer allow your past to be owned by your sin. Let it be owned by Christ so that your present becomes purposeful in his power and your future. Well, that eternity's already sealed up by him. He's promised you that. When you come face to face, well, with your past losses, Jacob went through this in this story in a brutal, brutal way. Jacob went through his past losses Imagine with me what it was like when the boys come back with food and extra money and they're like, yeah, it's kind of good news, but dad, he wants to see Ben. And all of a sudden, Jacob is reliving his worst day ever. The day he got, you know, the diagnosis, the horrible phone call, the, the coat handed to him with blood over it, and he said, surely my son has been devoured. Jacob is reliving his worst day in this story. He's remembering the deep, dark grief of losing Joseph, his beloved. He says, everything is against me. There is nothing on my side. I am losing everything. And when we face certain trials that evoke from us a memory of a painful loss, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I know this. Each person in this room has a loss that has laid waste to your life and has ruined you. It could have been a diagnosis. It could have been the loss of a loved one. I don't know what it was. I just know this. There have been losses that we wish to never revisit. But what happens when our past comes face to face with us and those feelings of that loss come flooding back? We get superstitious. We start holding on tight. We grasp. We hold on. Do you remember what Jacob's name was before God changed it to Israel? He was the grabber. He grabbed onto Esau's heel. He was always deceiving and finding a way but he was now Israel. His name had changed. And Jacob does something in this story that we're called to do. He, he does something that um, is very hard to do. He opens his hands up and says, if I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Go. Go. And it's brutal. But here's the really cool part that I think really preaches every day of our life. He didn't realize when he said go, he thought he was losing everything. He didn't realize God was in the business of redeeming his worst day. Who was coming home? Who was coming home? See, we know the story. We know that God had Jacob in Egypt, and Jacob, or Joseph in Egypt, and Jacob would see his son again. We know that's coming, but the reality of it is he doesn't. And God is in the business of redeeming our broken, dark losses. He brings back the things. He gives peace. He gives purpose. He brings to life that which was ashes in our life. Jacob, no longer the heel grabber, becomes participant in God redeeming the worst day of his life. If scripture holds true, which it always does, he does give beauty for ashes. Finally, when you come face to face, with those who have hurt you. 
This is really hard because we've all been hurt. We've all been destroyed emotionally, maybe physically. We've had different abuses on us. We've had different things said. It's, it's hard. But I want to go back to what Joseph did. Remember what happened when he went reptilian brain? He stayed a little bit removed from the situation, and he kind of pushed back and kept them at a distance. He gave himself space to process. Now, we can't throw People who've heard us in jail for three days and process what happens be nice, but can't do it. Um, but what he did is he gave himself some space to not respond out of his fight or flight. Because I guarantee he probably wanted to kick them into prison very violently and do some things. There had to be that want in him. He's lost so much, but he doesn't do that. He gives himself space, which tells me this. When someone who has hurt you reaches back into your life from your past, here's the deal. You don't have to let them back in to hurt you. You get to step back and say, we're going to do this on my terms, not yours. I can forgive you, but the, the reality is you don't have to let people back in. You can give yourself space to see if indeed you have healed, if you've moved to the place where you can allow that. The reality is we've also hurt people. Each and every one of us in this room has hurt other people. Incidentally or intentionally, we have hurt others. And I want to say something that may hurt a little, but it's true. If you've hurt somebody, don't ask them to heal on your terms. That's not right. That's abuse. If we've hurt people, we have to let them heal on their terms, not ours. We have to allow them the opportunity to process. Be faithful to the process of healing. Do not force yourself to please people. Force yourself. Take that moment and force yourself to step back a little bit and take account of what's going on and ask the question, what does God have for me even in bringing people who've hurt me back from my past into my present? It's frightening and it's overwhelming, but I do believe this, that if we are gonna be faithful, we have to step back and recognize that we celebrate communion tonight. And in celebrating communion, we celebrate the broken body of an innocent man, the Lord Jesus Christ, whose body was broken because we sinned against him. We sinned against him. We have to understand the cost of this faith and the reality that we are called as people to come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ as the ones who hurt him and be received back to him because he loves us. This faith is different than all others because of one thing, the Son of God did not see fit to be without you for eternity, but he loved you enough to die your death. We all have a past. We all have sins. And the problem is, if they're not in Christ, we dig them up and we feel guilty and we live bound to that corpse. There is one way for the church to live freely and lightly in the grace of God, and that is to cut yourself free by confessing, repenting, and turning towards the one who redeemed you. The message of the gospel never changes. And the apostle Paul was right when he wrote in Colossians that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has come and the, and the old is gone and the new has come. You are not owned by your past. You are presently, purposefully called by Christ to live it out. To live it out. To find where God's at work in this world and be part of the answer. So I want to encourage you emphatically, passionately, quit digging up that which has no hold on you. Hold on to the one who claimed you by his own body and blood. And as you do that and live in that grace, I guarantee you this, the world will see and know a hope they're dying to have. They're craving it if the church would live in that promise that our sin can't get dug up anymore because it's tucked into the wounds of him who died our death. As you go from this place, go in that promise. The old is gone, the new has come. Today matters and eternity is secure. Live as though you're the people of God filled with the spirit for the purposes of God. And as you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is super late. We're not gonna talk about that and you're gonna leave the building happily. Fair enough, you're dismissed. <laughs>